yeah, we discuss pre-sales and we, we said in a sense that pre-sales is an option that kind of is more available for event producers than other producers, so to speak. So that is perhaps one of the reasons why it's much more widespread in uh, events than in traditional manufacturing or service production. But uh, remember, as we said, that we kind of see options for pre-sales being executed in other, more should we say, more modern products. And of course, as our access to internet increases, then it opens up these possibilities, for instance, in the computer gaming industry, in the film industry, and uh, which is to some extent more uh, like the events than other industries. But we also see it in, in cars, uh, not so much in clothes. Uh, there seems to be this notion of, of product uniqueness. It must be something unique in order for you to kind of introduce this pre-sale stuff. Um, okay. Let me see. Now, you can read in the textbook, uh, there is a discussion there on kind of how to take pre-sale activity in the form of seasonal cards into account if you want to build a kind of regression model like the one we built here. Because then, of obviously, you have some added information, don't you? Before you make your forecast, you typically know how many seasonal cards you have sold. And uh, if you're aiming at counting not the actual number of people on the match, but the actual tickets sold, then you have a certain amount of tickets already sold. And of course, you are certain that those are sold, so you should take that information into account when it comes to doing uh, the actual modeling. Uh, there is a discussion in the start in that chapter on a kind of simple way to do this, where you can kind of just take your original data and remove the seasonal tickets, the, the amount, okay? But it may, that may lead into some problems. Because uh, historically, you could have sold less cards. And if you cannot take the original data and subtract the number of pre-sale tickets you have this season, you may end up with negative numbers. You see? Yeah, you probably, if you remember the, the actual numbers here, uh, yeah, you see that uh, against most there, you actually sold 408,017 tickets. And I told you that uh, the last two seasons, so they have probably sold maybe up to 6,000 tickets. And of course, if you take 4,817 and subtract 6,000, you get uh, <laughs> more than 1,000 negative. And then you have to handle that. So my suggestion actually is, is to kind of do it uh, something like this. And let me, let me try to explain now, okay? What we see on the top here is actually something which was kind of omitted earlier, just a kind of mathematical... We kind of just do what we did when we did this uh, in, in the first part of the course, where, but uh, we kind of add a multiple uh, set of variables. Here. So the structure is the same, you just calculate the errors on one side, you square them, and then you kind of look at this function. In the case we saw had only a single one here, not a sum here, okay? So it's kind of the same. So what we do in classical regression is that we minimize this square sum, okay? So we, we want to solve this minimization problem here, and it's not constrained. At the bottom here, I've kind of put up a constrained version of this one. And I put two constraints. Of course, this is the kind of value the model produces for the y variable. Okay? When you enter your predictions or the axis, then this is the output from the model, the y output, the forecast, if you like. And I say here that typical when it comes to football or other kinds of forecasts related to events, you might think of two added constraints. One constraint of the greater than or equal sort. Obviously, if you pre-sell 5,000 tickets, then it must be more than 5,000 tickets sold totally, okay? So then you get a greater than or equal constraint. The other constraint here is simply a capacity constraint. 
if the capacity of the stadium is given, and typically that is, then you cannot have more spectators than that. Okay? So you, you will have a kind of upper and lower limit here on, uh, on the number of people. And you would know this number, and of course you know this number. Uh, do anybody on you know the capacity of the Mulde? Uh, we can try to find it. Google is, as always, our friend. Uh, let's see. Capac uh, can maybe I should search in Norwegian. I write capacity. Okay, stadium in Norwegian. It says 11,800 here. Okay, let's uh, believe that one. <laughs> yeah, I know that it has been much more people on the stadium than that. I think it has been more than 13,000, actually. We can see here, if you look at Wikipedia, this is a Norwegian version, I'll have to translate a little. Uh, we're given as a gift by this guy and this guy, uh, and the architect. Uh, 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 they won the prize in 1999. Not bad. Another prize the same year. Uh, 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 it was started the 18th of April. Uh, the mold beat Lillestrøm 4 to 0. The first goal was a known goal. Uh, it was one uh, national team match against Saudi Arabia. I saw that one, 6-0, 1998, just before the World Championships in France, by the way. Yeah, there's a capacity of 11,800, where 10,100 are seats. The, the actual record is 13,308. And of course, as you probably know, the regulations has changed for football matches, so you have to have only seatings, only seat, seats now, so that typically takes all capacities down. Now, if we return to, to our examples here, uh, we, we, we see that we didn't actually utilize this information, did we? Because uh, if you look at our forecast here, you see that we forecast 12,059, which of course is larger than 11,800. So we could have adjusted that one just by adjusting it. Of course, that's one way of doing this. But if you want to do it slightly more scientific, you can kind of do this. So you kind of do your estimation based on the fact that you know that the number of spectators should always be larger than the number of seat tickets sold before the season. And then you cannot have more audience than the stadium capacity. Of course, if you want to look at different categories of audience, then of course you could have more of this. You have a certain amount of those seats, a certain amount of that seats. So you could kind of try to predict different seat groups, if that would be interesting. And that could, of course, be interesting, because you would expect that the demand for other services would depend on what type of customers it is. If you want to have the number of VIP seats, the number of second VIP seats, and so on, okay? That, and then that you would separate the first one into subcategories. And if there's different categories of seasonal ticket, which is, of course it also is, you can do the same there. The point is that this is a mathematical programming model, okay? And it's when we solve this, we just use derivatives. Okay, we can find we can find derivatives, equate and solve in that method. When we add constraints, then we are kind of over in this other world, which we have been staying now for a while, looking at load sizing and aggregated production planning. So then we need to use other other tools to solve it. It could be that we could solve these kind of tools, these kind of problems easier, but at least in general, you would have to use kind of lingual kind of type of software to solve it. Uh, the problem with this problem, as you may observe, is that we have a quadratic here, so we do not have a linear objective. But we have linear constraints. And this is a special type of a mathematical programming problem, we tend to call it a quadratic programming problem. And it turns out that a quadratic programming problem can be solved almost as easy as a linear program. So most of these software tools, they have a kind of standard mechanism for solving quadratic programs, and Lingo also has it. So it's really not a big challenge, at least not a much bigger challenge than solving an ordinary linear program. Of course, if it gets very big, then you may run into problems, but uh, the size here will typically not be that big, would it? In the example, we looked at we had 10 variables. Okay. In this case, it would be two constraints, so this is a very small problem, so it should be straightforward to solve it, actually. Okay, so this was kind of a very swift introduction to how we can kind of extend our 
regression models. But uh, if we do these kind of extension, then we will kind of have to use other tools than SPSS, for instance. SPSS could have special versions. I haven't, I'm not that familiar with the system that could handle these problems, but I'm not really sure they can. But as I said, we have other tools which we already have been discussing, which in general solves these kind of problems. Okay. So, final parts of chapter two, I think. Let's have a look here in the textbook. Uh, 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 yeah. Aggregated versus disaggregated forecast. We, I think we briefly touched this topic uh, when we discussed forecasting in the first part of the course. Um, by the mean aggregated, we kind of mean the whole event. It's, I should say the number of spectators on Hawker Stadium to refer to this example. Disaggregated would be the number of spectators who are uh, female, who are male, who are children, who are old, who have uh, certain uh, disabilities and so on. Okay. And in general, we could say that it is normally much harder to forecast at a disaggregated level. Okay. If I am to guess the number of spectators on the next home match, which I believe is against Tromsø, isn't it, Maria? Mm -hmm. yeah. You should know. You work there. The so. uh, I think the next home match, match is against Tromsø, isn't it? Uh, the, the next one, not, uh, not this week, not but this week next. Week. Yeah, isn't that against Tromsø? I think it's against Tromsø. I think so, but we can always find out. Now we look at another page, altomfootball.no. All about football. Uh, I think they have the, the schedule. Let's see here. Uh, Tippeligan. Again, sorry for the Norwegian. I will trans translate. Uh, you see here. You see here the 25th round. It's against. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Away against Haugesund, then we have to go further down here to get the whole list. What happened to the whole list? <laughs> huh? Yeah, we know we have the whole list, don't we? Maybe we don't. Yeah, we do. Uh, we do? No, this is not the whole list. This ends here. Ah. What about when the model says? Okay. We go to Google and we search for uh, we search for um, Tippeliga N and then we add what is the name of this in Norwegian? Terminliste schedule. Here is something. Ah, all kinds of huh? Tabel company, maybe this one. Here seems to be something. If we go down here, twenty-four. This is the previous one, Moldes on and Sulf, and then it is Molde Haugesund. Okay, no, nah, that, that no, sorry, it must be here. It's, we are going down here. How you see Molde, and then it's Molde Tromsø. I was right. Yeah, that's good. I like to be right. <laughs> of course, now I for, I've forgotten what I was what I was meaning to say. What uh, was I talking about? Yeah, talking about the the defined groups. Like yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and of course. I could guess roughly that it would be around 8,500 spectators on that match against Rooms. Okay, we, we know there's a fair amount of uh, tickets sold, 6,000, and uh, it has been around 8,000. Between 8 and 9,000 on all matches this season. So uh, I would guess 8,500. That would be a good guess. On the other hand, if somebody asked me to guess how many would be female and how many would be male, of course I could make a rough estimate, half and half, which is not right by the way. Then I would look into him in football and say, okay, maybe it's 75% men and 25% female. Okay. But from that on, it will be difficult. Okay. Among the male, who would be under 15 years? 
Okay, again, I could get some information, but again, it, it's starting to get more uncertain. Okay, how many are in wheelchairs? How many would buy a sausage? Then it becomes tricky. Okay, so this is what I mean by the difference between aggregated and disaggregated. If you kind of split it into subparts, then it becomes more complex. Same if you think about a uh, music festival containing a set of artists. You could uh, probably roughly say um, how much total audience you get over a given day or a week or whatever. But then again, started to split it down on these sub-events, the individual concerts, which people will attend individual concerts, you get tricky. We had this example about this car producer who produces cars, okay? You have a rough estimate of how many cars, but if you break it down into how many green and red and blue and so on, then it gets uh, tricky, okay? Because this is kind of tastes changing. <coughs> So, but, but still, as it says here, even though it's generally harder to forecast disaggregated, it's obviously maybe more important because it's kind of this disaggregated forecast that kind of governs your service demand related to the event. Okay, how many sausages, sausages how many beers, how many seats and so on. Okay, what kind of quality on the seats. You need to know a little bit more about the audience than kind of just the total number. How many of the audience speak Norwegian? How many speaks only French? Do I need a French interpreter or could I stick with an English one? Okay, these kind of problems are very important for your long-term profits and for the satisfaction of your, of your customers. And it's very important to kind of handle it. And to be able to do that, you need to know this, don't you? Or at least have some opinion on it. Of course, one way of solving the problem with the French interpreter is to say that, okay, we don't hire him now. We, we, we call him and say, could you come if it's necessary? But of course, that costs some kind of either money or some kind, of, some kind of cost it has, because you will have to kind of be on alert and maybe it's just easier to invite him. You can get a free concert if you come and I can, <laughs> I can use your French knowledge if it's necessary, okay. But th that is one thing which is typical with many events that what costs money in other situations does not necessarily cost at least so much money in the event side, okay. The, the kind of uh, ability to use volunteers is there in a different way when it comes to events than when it comes to actual production. So it's easier to get free, free labor when you deal with events. And much, or um, almost most events, they kind of hire people without wages, which is of course is always a good thing to do. But still you need to utilize these people in a sensible way. You need to coordinate their use, you need to get the right resource to the right customer at the right time to make it work. So you, even though it's free, it doesn't mean that you have kind of solved the logistics problem. On the contrary, you may have made a more complex logistics problem because you have typically a lot of resources on the human side and you need to assign the correct resource to the correct customer group, so to speak. So you, you, you read that. It doesn't mean that the logistics problems are solved because you still want as many happy customers as possible after kind of finishing this event. Okay. That was the end. So now we have kind of finished chapter two in this book. And there is, of course, a lot of chapters left, but still we have kind of um, captured. Uh, uh, let's see, we have captured uh, 50 pages, oh, only 100, and, uh, only 100. So we're kind of halfway now. Uh, I don't think we will move that fast for the rest, but uh, now we are in week. Do you know what week is this? 39. 39, yeah. So next week is week 40. I would expect that we finish by week 42. And the exam is set to week 44, I think. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then we will probably use week 43 for uh, going through uh, you know, some previous exams or something to do some discussion on that. So we, we are in kind of good, uh, good shape when it comes to time. And of course, the exam will be kind of more focused on this book than the other book. Uh, you will see that on the previous exams that we kind of spend time in, in this part, trying to focus on the event, which of course is the main point of the, of the, of the course. Uh, of course, to some extent, we spend more time on the first part, because then we kind of, but if I knew that you knew that, then we could kind of spend more on the second part. You see my point? We, yeah, so it, it's kind of just, uh, a consequence of your lack of knowledge, so to speak. 
uh, I think in the future we'll probably split this course in, to in two and kind of give this standard LOG 502 as the, the first part and then spend some more time on kind of recapturing the whole logistics arguments in, in this court course. So now it, it kind of floats through the course. I'm not sure whether that is optimal, but, but that's what it is for the moment at least. So, do we have any questions by the end of this day? I don't intend to move any further today. Any comments? Are anybody of you watching the videos? Yes. Is it, uh, is it okay? Can you see? Can you hear? Yes. Okay. It's okay. Are you looking on small screens or are you trying big screens? You haven't, have you tried big? You tried the big screen? A TV screen? No. 40 no. inch? No. 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 Okay, okay. Now I'm, uh, I've seen a little bit on it and in some cases they, it's hard to, to see the board. At least you have to put it on HD, I think. That's necessary. If you put it on 180p, seems to be necessary. Yes. Yeah. So you need a, a good internet connection. Yes. You probably know that you can download the videos. Well, didn't you know that? Should I learn you how to? Yeah, then we can turn off the camera.